thanks. Uh, so, as you said, my name's Matt, and I run the user research team at Scopely. And I was hoping to take the next 30 minutes or so and start a conversation with you guys about something that, uh, honestly, we haven't really talked much about at these conferences, which is the business side of what we do. Uh, and the reason I think it's important that we be having those conversations is because most of us are working on commercial products where most of the decisions are being made based on things like the expected return on the investment. Uh, and while we have many great presentations and great conversations about uh, approaches and methods we can use to increase the value that we're delivering, and we have very rarely actually discussed how to demonstrate that value. So I thought I would give it a start. Um, so just kind of a high level overview. Uh, my plan is to start by talking about how UX is set up at Scopely. Uh, because that both is, will inform kind of what gave rise to us looking into this, but also our approach to trying to answer some of these questions. Uh, and then I will dive into a little bit of how player satisfaction has connected to business metrics for us. Uh, for us, player satisfaction is just that high-level metric we use of what players think about our game. For some of you, it's fun or appreciation. Uh, it should all be pretty similar. And then finally, uh, I will touch on usability and how usability can drive player satisfaction, but also how uh, usability can directly connect to those business metrics if uh, usability issues are getting in the way of you monetizing. So I'll just dive right into it. Uh, you know, at Scopely, we have both UX researchers and UX designers, uh, two separate groups, but very, very closely connected in what we do. Uh, and one of our responsibilities as UX researchers is to pull together all of the various threads of feedback that we get from our players through all the different channels they have to give it to us and create one cohesive narrative out of what's happening in our games. Uh, we can then take that narrative, deliver it to the game teams where our UX designers sit, uh, and the UX designers are then able to take that, make sure it's being brought up in all of the various day-to-day -day meetings that the team is having, that you know, player focus is being kept uh, alive there, but also, they're in a position to help us work with the team and really figure out which issues that players are bringing up we are currently best situated to actually address. So once we identify some of those issues that we want to try and tackle, uh, it then comes back to us as researchers. We can go and really explore the problem space, make sure we fully understand what's going on there, uh, work with the teams to help them come up with uh, good or ideal uh, solutions, and then uh, of course, make sure that those solutions are usable. Now, ideally, this is uh, kind of a infinite cycle of just iteration and making our games better and better. Um, but one of the things that we used to run into was the problem of trying to convince our teams that focusing on these player issues was actually gonna solve the business problems that they were having, right? Uh, or the business issues they wanted to address. And the reason for that is really because we had not yet done our homework to show what that connection was between essentially making your player base happy and things like retention and uh, all the financial outcomes that you care about. So that was really where we kind of started on this path, was trying to make sure we're providing the information that our products teams, product teams need in order to uh, really weigh what their options were for what features to work on or uh, changes to make in the game. So uh, a thing that is kind of important to note is we uh, do mobile free-to-play, which means games as a service. And for those of you who are not quite familiar with what that is, it means we are basically constantly creating new events, new content, new features uh, for our players. So they continue to have new and interesting experiences in our games, uh, continue to drive engagement through that, and then, of course, we attempt to monetize off of that engagement. Now, one of the really nice things about doing games as a service is it also gives us the opportunity to get lots and lots and lots of data. And we can do things like make changes to the game, uh, sometimes through real A-B style experimentation, as was mentioned in talks earlier. And we can see what the outcome is from kind of all the business metrics that we care about. And sometimes these updates can be things that are purely designed to make the player experience better. Uh, some of them have no means of directly monetizing themselves, but we can still watch and see, does it actually uh, cause changes uh, in all those metrics that the business is gonna care about? Uh, so, uh, you know, this was a spot where 
we as researchers wanted to kind of dive in and really be able to show this connection between our work and these business outcomes. And one of the spots that we knew we could start was really examining uh, the first 30-day experience in games. Uh, for those of you not familiar, uh, in the first 30 days after install within uh, free-to-play games, there is a lot going on, a lot changing within your metrics. Um, you know, you have a lot of players who are going to come in, they're going to try the game out, and they're basically going to say, like, you know, nice, but not for me. And you will be losing people every day. Uh, in fact, you will lose the vast majority of the players who ever install your game. Uh, on the flip side, you're going to have players who are saying, yeah, I totally want to stick with this game, and it's going to be great. Uh, and some that are going to say, and I'm willing to invest more than just my time. Right? And they will make the decision of, I'm going to try making a purchase and see whether or not the experience I get is even better and worth my money, in which case you will usually see that first purchase happen during these first 30 days. Uh, and beyond that, you'll also see uh, if people are going to continue making purchases. Because right? the thing that you'll see a lot of is people will try one purchase and then they'll be like, you know what? not really worth it, I'm going to move on. Uh, and then a subset that will be like, that was amazing, you totally met or exceeded my expectations, I'm going to keep throwing money at this thing. Uh, so to try and really get to understand what was going on here from the player perspective, uh, what we did is we dropped a survey in our game that hits basically every player one week after they start playing. Right? And this allowed players to give us feedback fairly early on. We didn't want to go too early because we didn't want to like, interfere with that initial experience that was being created, but early enough that we could then uh, track what they did kind of going forward from when they filled out that survey and see how it impacts uh, business metrics. We also followed up on this with another survey uh, that hits, base, hits everyone uh, 15 days, or every increment of 15 days after they installed. So day 15, day 30, day 45, day 60, so on. Uh, and this lets us get data rolling in every single day from our players and uh, be able to segment it based on all kinds of things from player age to uh, types of engagement and whatnot. And so knowing kind of these three things about what's going on during these first 30 days, having access to this data, it put us in a position where we could make some hypotheses about how uh, player satisfaction was going to connect to these kind of business outcomes that we really want to focus on. Uh, and I'll walk you through those. They are fairly straightforward, but we're important on really establishing uh, the foundation for this work. So the first one is uh, players who are satisfied with the game should be more likely to keep playing, right? Retention should be higher. That shouldn't be a big surprise to anyone. If you like the game, you keep playing, and if you don't like the game, why would you? Nothing forces you to. Um, second one is players should be more likely, more likely to pay for the experience, right? So keep in mind, it's free to play. The basic business model here is deliver an experience that hopefully the players love and either explicitly or implicitly ask them, hey, do you want a deeper experience? If so, give us a few bucks. Uh, so if they're satisfied with the experience, they should be more likely to say, sure, I want to go deeper with this. Uh, and third, is gonna be that players who spend money and then say they're still having a good experience, right? Where you have met or exceeded their expectations, which are higher now that they've spent money, uh, should be more likely to continue spending money in your game, right? All fairly straightforward. Also leads to the fourth thing that was a question, which was really, what does that mean as a whole? And of course, our expectation was more satisfied community should result in greater revenue. Yeah. So, for these first three, uh, or I'll start, what we did is we looked at that data we had from the survey players filled out at day seven, and we tracked what they did going forward, and we're able to see uh, how do these things, how are these things impacted based on what players told us uh, their opinions of the game was. So, just hit these in order. Uh, the first thing we saw is players who are more satisfied have retention rates between five and 15 percentage points higher. Now, to give you some context, uh, Market-leading casual games have a day 30 retention of a little over 20%. Uh, core games tend to be about half of that. So when we're talking five to 15 percentage points, you're talking the vast majority of your audience. Right? Which again makes sense, if you don't like this game, why would you stick around? Um, but it ends up looking a bit like this. So 
uh, I'll walk you through this. The y-axis there is uh, retention. It's the percent of players uh, still playing your game out of, in this case, all the ones who filled out our survey. Uh, the x-axis is just time, so days since they filled out the survey. Uh, the dark blue line is people who gave kind of a positive uh, response on how satisfied they were, and light blue is uh, neutral or negative. And the important thing here is within even a day or two of people filling out this survey, Right, we see this kind of massive gap start to form, and that gap lasts. Uh, you can see it lasts as far as that graph goes. Uh, we continue to monitor this. I can tell you it lasts for at least six months. So what players are thinking about your game seven days in uh, is still impacting whether or not they're sticking around six months after that, potentially longer. So it's great, pretty big, uh, also pretty straightforward, right? Why would anyone stick around if they're not having a good time? Uh, so if we could look to the, in the monetization side of things, right, what we saw is players who were satisfied uh, are between 25 and 50% more likely to start spending money. And in addition, they were between 15 and 35% less likely to stop. So what this means is if we really focus on that player experience in those first seven days, right, focus on delivering a satisfying experience, fun experience, appreciate experience, however you're measuring it, uh, it should result in not only more players, but a higher proportion of them spending money, a higher proportion of them continuing to spend money, uh, all of which is, of course, great from the business side of things. Uh, and leads to the question of how much are we really talking about, right? What does that do to revenue? So uh, I'll walk you through kind of what our thought process is here, because what we did is a little different. Um, so one of the things that we know when we look at the business KPIs is they tend to be uh, trailing indicators, right? And what I mean by that is the action has already happened at the moment that we measure it and can report on it, right? So if someone's quit the game, they already quit by the time I know that it happened. If they're gonna make purchases, they already made the purchase at the moment that I, it happened. Um, but, you know, our thought was when we look to players' opinions, those should really be leading indicators, right? How I feel today should dictate what I do after that moment in which I tell you how I feel, probably doesn't dictate what I did a week ago. That would be kind of weird. Um, and we saw this a bit when we uh, were able to do some analysis looking at elder players quitting the game, right? Where uh, what we saw is players' behavior changes usually several months prior to them actually quitting, right? For people who have stuck around and really engaged with your game and uh, gone deep with it, it is very rare for them to just like rage quit, I'm done. Uh, instead what you see is this kind of slow unwinding of that game as part of their life. And so knowing that that happened, and obviously their opinion had to have changed prior to it happening, uh, we figured you know, when we're looking at things like revenue, we can't just look at how people are feeling today, we have to look at how they felt in the past. So what we did is we took monthly revenue and we match it up against uh, average player satisfaction from that same month, from the month before, from the month before that, and so on, uh, and stick it in, all into kind of a multiple regression and see what comes out of it. Uh, so I will walk you through this for those of you who do not like stats. Uh, basically what this is saying is uh, we could account for 88.5% of the change in revenue uh, using a model that looks at the current month satisfaction and the satisfaction from two months prior, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, in addition, you know, one of the really big things here uh, that drives two other components of this is uh, if we look at the satisfaction from two months prior, it is actually vastly more impactful than the, what people feel today. And there's a couple reasons that's important. So the first is gonna be uh, it means if I measure satisfaction today, I can take a pretty good guess at what our revenue is going to be two months from now, right? And being able to accurately predict future revenue, very important. It's how companies make their decisions around how much to invest and where. Uh, but the other piece of it is, it means if we can drive satisfaction changes, we can drive revenue changes, right? Because satisfaction changes first. Uh, and in fact, we've seen that very thing. Uh, and I could get into a bit of how we go about actually driving those, but I think that's all of your jobs, so you probably know. Uh, you know the main thing is, of course, that we focus on uh, 
just delivering against what player needs are and what their uh, requirements are. Uh, one of which is, of course, that our games are usable. Uh, and one of the things we really wanted to do was try to figure out how we could match usability up against player uh, satisfaction and against those business outcomes, uh, which is a little hard to do because we generally don't have great ways of quantifying usability. Uh, but we want to try. So what we did is we took uh, the system usability scale we modified it slightly so that it seems like it applies to games and that our players would know what the heck we were talking about. Uh, for those of you not familiar, this is a 10 question survey. It gives everyone a score on a scale from zero to 100, uh, which is essentially a measure of how usable they perceive your game as being. Right? So we could take that number, this is zero to 100, and match it up against what they told us for how satisfied they were, uh, you know, do basic correlation, and see what the relationship was. And what we found is that uh, their perceived usability accounted for between 25 and 33% of their satisfaction. And this was true across every game, every survey, every time period, no matter where we looked, it's always right in this ballpark, right? So it's accounting for 25 to 33% of the change in player satisfaction. Player satisfaction is accounting for 80.5% of your change in revenue usability indirectly accounts for a huge amount of your revenue, uh, which is great, but we want to go even further with that, right? There's the question of can usability itself connect to uh, revenue, like directly, uh, for which, uh, you know, the thought is, of course, if the problems you have are around monetization. Uh, so I'll walk you through a couple examples here. Uh, what we have up here is Wheel of Fortune. We are looking at the home screen, which is where players spend most of their time when they're not solving word puzzles. Uh, and one of the things that we noticed uh, doing a bunch of usability testing and whatnot is if you look at this screen, it is actually really hard to figure out where to go to, to get to the store. Right? Uh, in this instance, you have to tap the white plus in the green box next to the diamonds in the top right, and that is already too many words to even try to describe where the store is, uh, much less for players to go hunting and find it. So, you know, at one point we were redoing this screen for a variety of reasons, uh, and one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that we were surfacing the store uh, in a better way. So we built this. Uh, you can see uh, we put the store down here on the navigation bar on the bottom. It's right in the center. It's got some extra visual weight going on to it to draw people's attention. Uh, and what this ended up doing for us is we saw store visits. So it's just the number of times the store was open by our player base increased by 125%. Right? So more than doubled the number of times people opened the store, got whatever's in the store in front of people much more. Uh, we also saw day one conversion. So this is the number of people who started spending money their first day playing the game went up by 40%. So think about that for a second. We had nearly a third of our players who on their first day of playing were willing to spend money but hadn't been because we had failed to surface to them the opportunity to do so, right? So that's something you definitely want to fix and not leave. Um, but in addition, we want to go even deeper than this, and there's aspects within the store that we want to look at, um, particularly around subscriptions. Now, subscriptions are kind of wonderful for everybody. Uh, for our players, they offer uh, really the best value you're gonna get out of any purchase. That's generally true across free-to-play games. Um, for us as a company, subscriptions are offering uh, consistent, reliable revenue, kind of obviously valuable to have, um, and we've also seen that players who sign up for subscriptions are far more likely to retain in your game. Uh, so, you know, we offer people a free trial. This was our initial screen. Uh, it was doing reasonably well, uh, but you can see there's kind of this wall of text that's in there as to what people are actually getting. It's really small and actually difficult to read. If you know your player base, you know ours are also older, which tends to mean harder to read small text. Uh, so we wanted to revise this 
and we ended up building this. So a few changes that we made. One, obviously much bigger font. Uh, we broke apart that wall of text to make it seem more like bullets. Uh, we de-emphasized the no thanks. We're literally offering you something for free. I don't know why you'd say no. Uh, and the other thing was uh, knowing our players, knowing why they're playing our game. Right? Players tell us all the time that what they really like about Wheel of Fortune is it makes them feel smart. And the problem with the option on the left there that we started with is to some players it comes across as us being like, hey, do you want a hand? And if you're playing a game to feel smart and someone says, do you want help? The answer is no. Uh, so we reframed it to basically be like, congratulations, you earned this thing, uh, which makes players much more likely to say thank you. Uh, in addition, we really wanted to look at uh, when we were surfacing some of these options. Because if you're at a point where you have all the things that we're offering and we're like, hey, do you want this? A, you don't really see a value in it. And B, uh, you don't feel the impact if you say yes. So we were looking at aspects that let us get to essentially like just-in-time offerings, um, one of which is for tickets. So tickets are an energy system. You spend a ticket, go in and solve word puzzles. They regenerate with time. Uh, if you just keep playing, you will run out of them. And if you run out and then say, hey, I want to play again, you get this flow. That's basically, oh, you're out of tickets. How about we increase the number of tickets you have? Just sign up for a subscription. And between these two changes, right, how we introduced the free trials and making sure that we were delivering the option to buy this thing right at the moment that it mattered for you, uh, what we saw was a tripling in the number of people who signed up for the free trial, which again, great, it's free, you should definitely take it. Uh, and we saw subscription revenue go up by 35%. So both large uh, changes and good shifts for us uh, as a company, also good shifts for the players because we are delivering usually pretty outstanding value to them. Uh, so. And that was a lot to kind of rush through and unpack there. Uh, but let me just summarize up kind of what we saw, right? So the first thing was player satisfaction itself, that high level metric connects to retention, connects to spend, connects to revenue, and happens ahead of time. So driving player satisfaction should drive these things. We also saw usability directly drives player satisfaction, right? It's accounting for between a quarter and a third of player satisfaction in your game. So then indirectly, it's driving those other things. Uh, and finally, uh, usability could connect directly to revenue when the problems that you have are usability issues with your actual ability to monetize. Uh, and so my hopes here really is that you guys can take some of this, use it to help your own cases, you know, get your teams to focus on player experience, but more importantly is really just to start the conversation about this and make sure we're all discussing what are the business implications of what we do. Because I think it's gonna be really important helping us as an industry grow within games. Uh, and so hopefully you guys can take this as a starting point, think about how you can test in your own games and next year uh, do your own presentations that can go perhaps deeper into this. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, thank yeah, you. hitting them straight in the wallet is definitely gonna help us get heard. Uh, yeah. That's a very a very effective way to get into the, some of those hard meetings. But, yeah, I mean, uh, two, I think. Two quick sure. questions, one simpler, one uh, less simple. The first is, uh, the, the surveys that you mentioned that you published, do you push those to every single player or do you sample? Uh, they are available to every single player, not every player will actually fill them out. Sure, right. And then the, the second one is I'm curious, this is uh, a little trickier, but how well do you think everything you just talked about tracks to console or AAA or box products? Yeah, right. it's a great question. Um, so the first thing I would say is I think for many or most of the AAA games that we've seen, like including games as a service elements is definitely a direction they're going where this stuff's all gonna be applicable. 
um, to more just traditional, like here's 60 bucks and I'm done, uh, the connection is going to be uh, less straightforward, right? It's going to be things like, do you really want to pick up the next one? Do you want to pick up the DLC? That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think the part that's interesting to me is that connection of usability is satisfaction, satisfaction is money. Is that part true across the board, do you think? I would hope so. Uh, say yes, so that I can use it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yay! Uh, yeah, it really depends on, like, are you going to be able to monetize in any way after they have the, experience, the initial experience, right? So if you want to sell DLC, if you want to sell any uh, microtrans stuff in your game, yes. If you want people to come back for the sequel, probably. Um, Thank you. Hi, Matt. Hi, nice. Michelle. Good. Um, so actually kind of segueing off of Jonathan's question, I don't know how much you can actually share on this, but I was curious if you could give us a little bit more information on what kind of, what, what the survey looked like that you gave to players. Was it all just like ratings based? Um, I highly doubt, was there any qual in there? Just curious. Yeah, uh, so the basic survey itself has the kind of rate the game as a whole and then uh, two open-ended questions. One is essentially what do you like and the other is what do you dislike, uh, which just makes it easier for us to analyze by separating the two. Hi, um, thank you for the talk again. Um, I see that most of your analysis is based on the assumption of what is player satisfaction. So um, how did you actually measure player satisfaction? Was it a, through a questionnaire or was it? Uh, uh, yeah, it's through a survey question that we've iterated on and built in order to uh, be able to measure that, right? And a bunch of what we're seeing here, the fact that it matches up with what our hypotheses would be around like retention and everything just helps validate that what we built is in fact measuring what we want to measure. And do you show it uh, in, the, in the game or after the gameplay or when exactly? Yeah, so the way ours are set up is uh, in these mobile games you have things called interstitials. They're basically those full screen takeovers. You'll oftentimes see them when it's like, hey, there's something new in the store, go check that out. Uh, we have those pop up that are basically like, hey, come give us feedback. And if you hit OK on it, uh, it's going to bounce you to your browser where the survey will exist. Oh, yeah. Um, thanks for that. <clears throat> I need to make sure I word this correctly. Um, think about the free to play thing you mentioned and your why. Uh, no, not free to play, sorry, the, the free trial. Why would someone not do the free trial? So I just wonder if you looked into, you know, the, without speaking for users um, or players, in some cases we've been trained to mistrust a free trial. There's a lot of bad experiences around free trials and you get locked in and you've suddenly got to try and get your way out of a refund or whatever. Um, so is that something that did that come up in your read in your design? How have you ensured that people can trust your free trial and you're not having to sort of remember to disconnect and things like that? Yeah, uh, great question. So part of the problems that we have with trying to do things like ensure that they can trust ours is ours are all done through the platform holders, right? So you can sign up in the game to get the subscription for, uh, you know, on iOS or on Android. But to actually cancel the subscription is usually done through the OS itself. So there's not much we can do to be like, hey, remember to unsubscribe. Plus, you know, we wouldn't really want to say that. Um, but like, you can't actually unsubscribe from within the games. Uh, and that's true of all apps that it happened to be on those. So there's nothing much we can do about it, unfortunately. Um, so first of all, first off, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I just had a quick question about the way that you me measured satisfaction. You said that it was just like a simple um, couple question thing. Do you think it'd be beneficial to look at it more in depth, or do you think more questions would scare people away from answering them? Yeah, great question. Um, we actually have other surveys that go way more in depth on whatever aspect we're looking for. These ones we intentionally keep short because we are popping in front of people literally every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want, we want them to get in the habit of being like, I can go in and just answer this quickly uh, and like move on instead of them thinking like, oh, this is going to be a 20 minute survey every time because then they'll just stop answering. Uh, and ideally we can actually get it to a situation where we can pop the question straight into the game itself uh, natively, in which case we can just be like, hey, welcome back. Tell us what you think. And the scale is literally right there, uh, which we have for some of our games, but not all. Hi. Is this on? Yes. 
Uh, funny, uh, a few months ago I did a very similar thing where I also had to adapt the SUS scale to an in-game store. Um, what, what did you find was the most challenging thing about adapting that, that questionnaire and have, do you have any tips on what to do to actually make it more game relevant and like in-game store relevant than classic usability? Sure. Uh, so the first thing is the scale like on every question asks about the system and so like we just change that to be like the game. Uh, the, I think the biggest problems we run into tends to be uh, dependent on which audience you're surfacing it to. Um, you know, for some of our games, they're definitely targeted at uh, older people versus younger people, and uh, some of those questions seem a little odd as well as very repetitive, and you can end up seeing a bunch of churn happen when you do that, uh, which is part of why uh, we were using it in order to get a gauge to see like how that, what connection is, and then have kind of largely shut it off from there. Like we know mostly what to expect, right? Like if you put in a new feature, it probably goes down because you made your game more complicated. If you put in a bunch of stuff to address the issues players are bringing up, it goes up. Um, so yeah, we put it in order to get the data to be able to match it up, but have kind of largely stepped back from it now that we we've established kind of where our games are at and just use it every now and then as like a checkup of like has this gone way better or way worse since the last time we looked. Well, Steve kind of already answered it but I'll ask anyway. Um, the fact that you were asking the same questions every 15 days, do you think that made them slightly apathetic when they kept seeing this questionnaire pop up and do you think that might have led to the decrease in um, satisfaction? Um, our numbers do not suggest that that's the case. Uh, so like we, if you track an individual, you don't see their satisfaction just going down over time. Um, there are changes that happen with age in the game, but that was true even when we first turned the survey on. Uh, so at a point before, people would have ever gone kind of apathetic about it. Um, there are things you have to do to deal with. Uh, the fact that like some players will be like, I already answered this, I don't need to go back in. Um, which one of the ways to handle that is just have several different pieces of artwork that you use on an interstitial uh, so that it's like, hey, it's a different survey than last time. No, just kidding. Uh, by that point, they've already answered. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, do you guys reward in a way or another the users who uh, answer the survey or like with currency yeah. or stuff? Uh, great question. So we do not reward people for filling out our surveys. Uh, and the thought process behind that is we know that um, incentivizing things can have very weird effects on people's motivation, right? And if you incentivize kind of too little, then people internalize and you end up with like better ratings. If you incentivize too much, they externalize their motivation for filling it out uh, and the ratings go down. And it is probably impossible for us to offer something of equivalent value like across all of our games. Right? $5 in a super casual game is not the same as $5 in a JRPG. Uh, and so in order to avoid like what bias would be there and created by it, we just don't incentivize at all. Um, so how do you spend your time in looking at the long-term effects of some changes you make to a game, especially like long-term negative side effects? Like, yes, you can see a 40% uptake in a short-term metric, right? They won't pay a rate, but what about lifetime value a year in. Do you look at that afterwards? Uh, yes. So lifetime value actually is uh, where we are primarily interested in. Uh, getting money in the short term is not worth a whole lot uh, if it hurts you in the long run. Uh, and that was one of the things that we saw and were trying to address when we were going through this whole exercise with our teams is there's definitely ways that you can be like, I'm going to do this thing and make a couple million dollars today but it's gonna be a bad experience. And like, does that hurt you in the long run? And the answer is yes. Have you, have you, sorry, have you gone back on that change? Have you rolled stuff back six months and nine months in because you saw that you hurt people? Uh, we have not rolled stuff back in the sense of like taking it completely out of the game. We have done edits and revisions to things that were in there. Uh, sometimes we've done things just to kind of de-emphasize that it's there and be like, let's just pretend it doesn't exist. Hi there. I have a, a specific question about the VIP. Was that something you brought in post-launch? 
Uh, the subscription? Yeah, yeah that was yeah. post-launch. Did you notice any on the satisfaction? Uh, users before who, who did, no long, did not sign up to the VIP, if, if all things being equal, their satisfaction dipped, that that now existed and they were refusing to take it? Uh, that is a great question. I don't know as though we actually looked at like the same individuals before and after. Um, yeah, be good to go back and take a look. I noticed you, uh, I think you said that you started surveying around day seven. Did you find that surveying earlier produced um, not so good data? Uh, sure. So. Our initial approach was don't go too early because you don't want to mess with that initial experience and for the people who are going to stick around to mess with um, them establishing play behaviors, right? Our concern was essentially that by putting a survey too early, we would interfere with retention itself. Um, so we started with day seven. We have since started putting some earlier than that uh, and not seen any real negative consequence. Um, I obviously would not put one on like day one. That would probably be bad. Um, but we've gone as early as day three, uh, really just depending on what data it is we're looking for. Uh, so if you want to know like that real early experience, day three is, uh, seems like a good place to put it. Did you find your um, survey results correlated very strongly with the storefront reviews or was there some divergence between the two? Uh, there is some divergence, some of which is uh, of our own doing. So. Uh, when you get a prompt in a mobile game to go rate it, like that's not just at random. We choose when to surface it and to whom. So you tend to intentionally pick the point where you know someone's going to say something good uh, or is far more likely to say something good. Um, so those scores tend to be quite biased, uh, intentionally so. OK, any more? Oh, thanks. thanks. Uh, so, so one of the nice things to see was that you had this correlation where you say, if satisfaction of a group of people drops, that's basically the beginnings of the end for their engagement. And, and do, you, do you have a sort of more or less targeted strategy for, for re-engaging at that point? Like, is there the trigger points that make stuff happen? How do you do that? Sure. Uh, so there are a variety of ways, either from what people say in our surveys or just looking at the analytics that you can identify that people are starting to churn from your game. Uh, depending on how certain you want to be is going to affect how early you can tell. Uh, and then there are things that you can do to try and re-engage those players. Uh, it's going to be different for each game and really depend on what reasons uh, you know exist for why people churn out. Uh, but usually giving them something that helps fulfill whatever need is not being fulfilled is going to help drive that. So like, again, like the things I would do in like Yahtzee are not the things I would do in Walking Dead. Um, and you just have to take it on kind of a game by game basis and possibly even go deeper into like whatever segmentation you have to say, this is a person from group A who is now churning from this game we know this is the thing that they probably want. All right. I think in like the last 10 or 20 years of this business, these are the, the best statistics that have ever been presented publicly. So double thanks from all of us and from everyone for sharing this with us today. Thank you. Sure.